Okay, the children may be dismissed for Children's Church at this time. And if you have a Bible, turn in it to Genesis chapter 12. We took a bit of a hiatus last week because of the flu. So thankful for Joe who literally stepped in at the last minute. So uh, very thankful for Joe, a guy that I love and trust and who is always willing to serve God's people uh, and to serve you guys, God's people here at 11th Street Baptist Church. So very thankful to Joe. We'll pick up now in our series through Genesis. Remember, our series is all about God's kingdom, and the title of this sermon is that God's, the kingdom of God strikes back. So let's uh, read from God's perfect <clears throat> and inspired word, Genesis 12, verses 1 through 9. <clears throat> The word of our God that is perfect and has preserved for us without error says to us in Genesis 12, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran. And they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place of Shechem to the oak of Moriah. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going toward the Negev. May the Lord bless the reading and now preaching of his word. In Genesis chapter 10 through Genesis chapter 12, we see a genealogy. And basically, uh, the entire book of of Genesis is built off of a genealogy. But in the midst of this genealogy that we have in Genesis 10 and 11 and 12, we have two narratives uh, that kind of break the genealogy. The first is the Tower of Babel in Genesis 11. And the second is the call of Abram in Genesis 12. And when we compare these two stories, we see that Moses has very intentionally put them side by side. We see in Genesis 11 that God's people or we see in Genesis 11 that the people of Babel are congregating together. They're staying in Babel. We see in Genesis 12 that Abram's commanded to go. We see that the people of Babel are being disobedient. They're seeking to make a name for themselves for their own good. In Genesis 12, we see Abram forsaking all sources of protection and provision, being obedient to God. We see in Genesis 11 that the people of Babel desire to make a name for themselves. And in Genesis 12, we see that God promises to make a name for Abram. We see in Genesis 11 that sinful man seeks to manipulate God and ensure, through their own efforts, divine blessing. And yet in Genesis 12, we see that instead of man ascending to God, we see God descending to man. We see that the result of man attempting to get to God is curses in Genesis 11. And we see in Genesis 12 that the result of God coming to you and me is blessings. These narratives are put together on purpose to communicate an important theological truth. God's kingdom is coming because God comes to us. God's kingdom, God created the earth to establish his kingdom on earth. And God's kingdom is coming despite you and me. 
And it's coming because God comes to us. So these narratives are put together. And the first part of this narrative is God's call to Abram. The first thing we need to learn is who is Abram, who is later named Abraham. First, he is in the line of redemption. We see two genealogies happening in Genesis. We have the line of the serpent, who comes from Cain and his genealogy. And then we have the genealogy of Eve that is traced through Seth and then traced to Noah and then uh, traced through Shem and now to Abram. So Abram's of the line of redemption, and yet he was still a sinner. Abram was a sinner like the rest of mankind. Remember Genesis 8.21, even after the flood, God says the thoughts of man are evil continually. Noah was no exception to that rule, and neither is Abram. Abram is a sinner. Moreover, Abram's family were moon worshipers. They were from Haran, and Haran was a moon cult. They worshipped Sin, the god and goddess of the moon in Haran. And uh, when you look at uh, the names of his family, Terah, and Sarai uh, are moon-worshipping names. We see that Abram is a pagan. He is of the line of redemption, and yet he is a sinner like the rest of mankind. In fact, we're going to come to this verse a few times throughout the sermon, but when we come to Romans 4.17, the apostle Paul says that when God called Abram, he was bringing into existence the things that are not. The call of Abram is new creation. We have seen from Genesis 3 through Genesis 11 the de-evolution of creation. We have seen creation being unraveled because of human sin. And yet in Genesis 12, we see God coming on the picture and taking a moon worshiper and making him the means whereby the nations are blessed. So Abram's of the line of redemption, but he is a big sinner like everybody else. Therefore, what we see is that Abram is called by God, not because of Abram, but because God is holy. God is devoted to his plan. He will establish his kingdom on earth. Therefore, he calls Abram. The next thing we need to know is the command. This is a frightening command. God comes on the scene and says, go. And notice how the pronoun your is repeated multiple times in the first verse. Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house. There is no LAPD in the ancient Near East. There is no police department. You are protected if you have a big family. So this call is a call for Abram to leave his source of protection. There is no social security in the ancient world. And there might not be by the time I'm ready for social security. Your social security in the ancient world is your family. And yet Abram is commanded to leave his family. And notice again that word your is repeated actually four times in the Hebrew Bible. Your, 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 your. Abram is commanded to leave everything that is familiar. Abram is commanded to leave his protection, his provision, and everything that's familiar. When our world hears that, they don't think this is the pathway to blessings. Our world doesn't Look at this command, Abram, leave your family, leave your source of protection, your source of provision, and everything that's familiar to you, and be blessed. Our world looks at that and sees that is the pathway to loneliness. That is the pathway to hurt. That is the pathway to poverty. But that's our God. Isn't that the God we serve? He's so different than this world. The pathway to blessings is the pathway that's least expected. The pathway to blessings is through Abram, a moon worshiper. The pathway to blessings is through Sarai. And we've already learned that she is barren. How can God make a great kingdom of Abram 
when his wife is barren. The pathway to blessings are very different than what this world thinks. The pathway to blessings, brothers and sisters, we see at the cross. Isn't that the least expected thing possible? The cross of Jesus Christ? The cross is a form of execution. That is the curse. Paul says, and he's quoting Deuteronomy, cursed is everybody who dies on a tree. And yet the curse is the pathway to blessing. God is commanding Abram to leave everything that's, every source of protection, provision, and everything that's familiar. And he's promising that this is the pathway to blessings. And notice that Abram, he doesn't even know where he's going. Notice what verse 2 says, uh, or the end of verse 1, and go to the land I will show you. Abram doesn't really know where he's going. In fact, uh, Hebrews 11.8 says that Abram went by faith to a land he didn't even know about. This is an act of obedience, and it is so different than what we've seen in Genesis 3 through 11. We have seen God pursue Adam and Eve, and yet they have sinned grievously. Cain, we've seen him pursue humanity at the flood. We have seen God's pursuit of his people, and we've seen constant disobedience. But here, we see God calling Abram, And we see Abram obeying. So we've learned who Abram is. He is no different than the rest of humanity. And yet he is going to be the means of blessings because God is holy. And we've seen the command. It is a command to leave his protection and his provision and everything that is familiar. But God gives Abram six promises. Six promises. And they're grouped into two groups of three. The first three promises are found in verse 2. And these are promises given directly to Abram, and they're from God. So let's look at the first promise again. And I will make you into a great nation. Now we've already learned that Sarai is barren. And a great nation demands lots of kids. So the question we're thinking is, how can this be the case. Well, it's the case because it's going to be dependent on God. God is going to establish his kingdom based on his own prerogative. God is going to be the means behind establishing the king, this kingdom. And that is so different than Genesis 11. We see in Genesis 11 a desire to establish a kingdom based on human ingenuity and human hard work. But now in Genesis 12, we see that God's going to establish a kingdom through the most the least likely means, a barren woman. This is what God does. He's going to make Abram into a great, great nation. And at this nation, you're going to have God at the center. So in Genesis 11, you have man at the center of this kingdom. But the result isn't a great nation. The result is curses. But now at Genesis 12, with God at the center, we see that the result is blessings. Indeed, the kingdom of God will come to this earth, and sinful humanity will be blessed, but this will happen when God's at the center on God's terms, not your terms and not my terms. What we see here in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, is that blessing becomes a dominant theme. In fact, the word blessed or blessing occurs five times in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, and it's so Uh, It's so intentional because the word for curse occurs five times in Genesis 3 through 11. So here we have this daunting reality as we march from Genesis 3 through 11. We saw the gravity of human sin. We saw the hopelessness of human sin. We saw how human sin morphs and grows and grows, and we were forced to ask the question, is there any hope? Is there any hope? And what Moses is saying, the author of Genesis, in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, is he's saying there is hope that there will be blessings that is up to the task. Five curses, five blessings, it will be up to the task, but it will be completely on God's terms. The, nation, the world will be blessed, the nations will be blessed, not when we ascend to God, but when God descends to us. Now the second promise, I will bless you. <laughs> Now, this is so unexpected in light of what we just got done talking about. Human sin, when we think about human sin 
and we think about what it is, it's, it's kingdom independence, declaring that we can be autonomous from God. We can be our own gods. We don't want you anymore, God. That's the essence of sin. And when we see here that God says, I will bless you, it is so unexpected. You couldn't have written this script. The fact that God could bless sinful humanity And notice again how personal it is. Notice the subject of these verses. I will bless you. It doesn't say Abram will be blessed. No, God's making it very clear. I'm going to be the one who does this. Very personal. I will bless you, Abram, in a very unexpected way. And then we have the third promise. We have... uh, I will make your name great. Now, we are immediately reminded, like I mentioned at the beginning of the sermon, of Babel. We have these people who want to make a name for themselves. They want to grab for themselves fame. And we see that the result of that is curses. But here we see in Genesis 12, verse 2, that God promises to make Abram's name great. In these first three promises... What we have is God promising Abram that he will give him a kingdom, a kingdom that is richly blessed. Now, the word blessing can be a bit obscure. What does it mean to be blessed? We say, when somebody sneezes, we say, bless you. What does it mean to be blessed? In the Old Testament, blessings fundamentally meant a restored relationship with God. So what we've seen from Genesis 3 through 11 is the curse The curse is broken relationships with God and broken relationships with one another. But now the blessings of God's kingdom is a restored relationship to God and a restored relationship to one another. God's kingdom will be characterized by blessings, namely restoration. And that's what this world so desperately needs. Now, the first, uh, so we have the command, go, leave everything that's your source of protection and provision and familiar. Go from it, and I'm going to make you into a great nation. And then we have a purpose statement at the end of verse 2. Why is God doing this? Why is God coming to Abram and calling him? Why is God promising to bless Abram? Notice what the end of verse 2 says. So that you will be a blessing. We have Genesis 12, verse 2. The purpose of God calling Abram is so that he would be a blessing. And this was always the plan. The purpose of God's people is always to be a blessing. We saw that Adam and Eve were made in the image of God in order to be fruitful and to multiply and to fill the earth. They are God's people to spread God's glory. That's what that's saying. We saw that Noah, it's the same thing with Noah. He is to be fruitful and multiply. He is to spread God's glory. We see with the nation of Israel that they are made into a kingdom of priests so that they can bless the nations. And we also see in 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 9, so let me turn over to 1 Peter. I have, you know, my wife got me this super fancy Bible when I started preaching here, pastoring here, and there's all these tags, and I didn't even use them. I'm sorry, honey. But 1 Peter 2... Verse 9 through 10, Peter says, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. That's identity. You are God's people. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. God called Abram to bless the nations. And God has saved you and me to preach the gospel. Do we know that? We often think that preaching the gospel or blessing others is peripheral to the Christian life. Oh, you know, we have an evan- we don't have an evangelism team here. But that's a good thing because we're all on the team. Right? We sometimes think of evangelism that's just for the that's for the super Christian. Sharing the gospel, that's just for the extroverts. No, if you're a Christian, and I know, I think almost all of you now, very personally, you are saved 
in order to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. It's not peripheral to who you are. Remember, what's God's plan in creation? To establish his kingdom, and his kingdom is to spread over the entire planet. God's plan is to create for himself a kingdom that spans the entire planet. And we spread God's kingdom by preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our purpose. Now think about it. You know, sometimes I see sports cars on the freeway, and they're going like 60 miles an hour, and I think, how awful. Do you guys ever think that? Like you see a Porsche 911 or a Lamborghini, and you just, and I just want to laugh, because here I am in my $20,000 Toyota Camry with hubcaps, and I think, hey, my thing's doing the same thing as your half a million dollar car right there. You know, like you see a Lamborghini in the slow lane, and you think, man, that Lamborghini must be really sad right now. You see an F-450 towing a Sea-Doo, and you think, wow, that F-450, if it had feelings, would be really sad right now. Because the purpose of the Lamborghini is to go fast. The purpose of the F-450 is to tow something big, not something small. I mean, you just imagine the F-450 is like, come on, man, give me something to work with here. When you see a Jeep, you know, it has the headlights, it has the gas can on the top, it has even the shovel, and you see... You see, it's clean as a whistle, and it's going down the 10 for you. And you think, man, that Jeep has to be crying right now. The purpose of the Jeep is to go off-roading, right? The point is, we have most joy when we live according to our purpose. The Lamborghini is at its fullest potential when it's going 220 down the road. The F-450 is at its fullest potential when it's towing 22,000 pounds. The Jeep is at its fullest potential when it's climbing rocks and in the dirt and it's dirty. That's its fullest potential. Brother and sister, you will have mo- the most joy in your Christian life when you proclaim the glory of our God to the lost around you. When you live an intentional life about reaching the nations, blessing the nations, you will have the greatest joy. Because that's what you were made for, and that's what you were saved for. Now, sometimes it's hard to share the gospel. I get it. I get afraid, too. I really do. Sometimes I'm, I think, man, they're going to think I'm awkward, or I don't know how to transition. You know, there's lots, there's lots of there's fear involved. I get it. I'm not trying to mitigate that fear at all. But what I am trying to do is to help you guys understand that this is your purpose, to preach the gospel with your lost neighbors. And that if you engage in that, despite the fear, you will have overwhelming joy. So how do we do that? Well, one thing is you can get involved at 11th Street Baptist Church because the leaders here, we try and be very intentional about giving you opportunities to evangelize the lost. Uh, A couple months ago, we went through evangelism training on our Sunday night uh, 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 series, our Sunday night Bible study. Last week, uh, we thought of the ends of the block ministry, which was all about getting equipped to share the gospel with our neighbors. So one way is you can just get involved with the activities here and we'll help, we'll equip you. Another way is how many non-Christians do you know? You know, if you don't know any non-Christians, you're probably not going to share the gospel with anybody. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't know a lot of non-Christians anymore because I teach at a seminary, and I hope there's no non-Christians there, and uh, I pastor you guys. So I'm not around a lot of non-Christians. I have to be intentional. The same thing with you. Like, build relationships with non-Christians. Be intentional about getting to know your neighbors. Be intentional about getting to know your coworkers. And then be intentional about sharing with them the gospel. This is the path of your joy because this is your purpose. Abram was chosen by God, was called by God in chapter 12, verse 2, in order to bless the nations. So let's do this together. And trust me, this is the source of great joy for you and I. So we have a command to go, three promises all for Abram, but then a purpose statement. And now we have three more promises. And these promises aren't for Abram. They're for other people. They're for you and me. 
So we learn in verse 3 um, that God says, I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Three more promises for other people this time. The, first, uh, the fourth promise here is that God will bless those who bless you. Notice that the word is plural here, those. It's not, I will bless the one who blesses you. I will bless those who bless you. <clears throat> God desires to bless a lot of people. He really does. God's not stingy with his kindness, and he's not stingy with his mercy. God desires to bless a lot of people through Abram and through you and me. And notice also that God is the subject again. This whole call and all of these promises are so, so personal. God is the one who will do the blessing. And again, just notice the pathway to blessings. The pathway to blessings is not Babel. The pathway to having restored relationships, the pathway to a restored relationship with God fundamentally is not based on your effort. The pathway to blessings is based on God's effort. When God comes down to us, the result is blessing. So, brothers and sisters, it's so tempting to think, well, if I just do, if I just do A, B, C, and D, then maybe God would bless me. If I just do A, B, C, and D, then maybe God would forgive me. If I just work really hard, then maybe I can have the right to ask things from God. It's so easy to think that if we just do, 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 and perform, 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 then God would bless us, and that is demonic. The pathway to blessings is when God comes to us, and that's the gospel, is that the only way that you and I can be blessed is that Jesus Christ, who's always been God, humbled himself, take on, took on flesh, and came to this earth. He lived the life we were called to live, and then he died our death. God has descended to us, and the result is blessings. God promises to bless those who bless Abram. And he, but he also promises to curse the one who curses Abram. But notice here, the text says, and him, singular, this is in plural, and him who dishonors you I will curse. Do you see the heart of God here? God wants to bless a lot of people, you know, and he, he wants to curse only a small amount of people. That's God's heart. He wants to have lots of people restored into relationship with him. God's hope in the Abrahamic covenant is that many people would be blessed and that only few people would be cursed. And then the final promise is that in Abram, all the families of the earth will be blessed. This is a summary statement of the previous promises and a statement of great, great hope. In you, all of the families will be blessed. It's just a statement. It doesn't say, and might be blessed, does it? it, it, it this, this is a statement. They're going to be blessed in Abram. God's plan will be achieved. So the question we're asking in Genesis 3 through 11 is, does sin derail God's plan? Does my sin mean that God uh, it, uh, uh, does not want to save me? Does, does my sin mean that God has utterly rejected me now? And the answer here is absolutely not. Sin does not derail God's plan. We have the promises given to Abram. The nations will be blessed. God's plan will be achieved despite you and despite me. Now that is a proclamation of the gospel. And if you had any doubt, Galatians chapter 3 tells us so. So uh, turn to Galatians chapter 3 and let's just read that. So we have in Galatians chapter 3 verse 8. I did use my little tab for this one, honey. So Galatians 3 verse 8. And the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith preached the gospel <laughs> beforehand to Abraham saying, and you shall all the nations be blessed. 
This is the gospel of Jesus Christ in Genesis chapter 12. The nations will be blessed through Abram. So what we've seen so far is that God gives incredible promises to Abram. He commands Abram to go, and Abram obeys. And he gives him amazing promises that he is going to give to Abram a kingdom that will be the means whereby sinful humanity is blessed. Now let's read again verse, uh, f- verses 4 through, let's see here. Let's read verse 4 and learn about Abram's obedience. So Abram went as the Lord had told him. And Lot with him, Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. He was nearing Social Security, and he left it. So Abram went as the Lord had, has commanded. We haven't seen much of that since the fall. We haven't seen much of the Lord commanding and a person obeying like this. Actually, the only time this happens is with Noah. So Abram is an anomaly, but it's, we understand it. Because Romans 4 Verse 17, let's turn there actually, Romans 4. You know, when the New Testament quotes the Old Testament, it's important that we we know it. So notice Romans 4, verse 17 says, As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations, in the presence of the God in whom he believed, referring to Abram, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. God calls into existence the things that do not exist. The call of Abram in Genesis 12 is a new creation. Just like in creation where God calls into existence the, th- the world that doesn't exist, now God again is calling into existence the thing that does not exist, namely God's promise to bless the nations. This is an act of new creation. Therefore, it makes sense that Abram would obey. When God created the world and said, let there be light, did the light obey? Yes. When God speaks in this manner, the world obeys. The same way in Genesis 12, when God speaks new creation, Abram obeys. We see just like in creation, the world going from nothing and going to creation. Same thing with Abram. We see a world of hopelessness going to a world of hope. Just like in creation, we saw a world that did not flourish, and in creation, God takes it to a world that does flourish. So with the call of Abram, he is promising taking a cursed world and taking it to a place of flourishing, a blessed world. The call of Abram is new creation. And notice how, Abram's, notice how Abram replies. Notice his response in chapter 8, or sorry, in verse 8 through 9. He builds an altar, and he worships. That is the proper response to God's call. So what is God requiring of you? Or what should you do as a Christian? Well, we could fill that in with a lot of things, but foundationally, what are you called to do? You are called to worship the God who saves you. We constantly see in Scripture that when God reveals himself to his people, the natural response is always worship. So we saw at the end of the flood, Noah builds an altar. We see that when God calls Israel, the people build the tabernacle, a place of worship. And we see it right here in Genesis 12. God calls Abram, and the response is he worships. The proper response to God is worship. Now notice in verse 7, one last thing. Chapter 12, verse 7 says, And the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. These promises are given to Abram and his offspring, singular. These promises of a great nation, that promise is given to an offspring of Abram. And we learn in Galatians 3 and 4, because Paul quotes this very verse, that that offspring is Jesus. What is the kingdom? What is the kingdom that can bless the nations? It's the kingdom of Christ. Jesus is the offspring who inherits all of these blessings. And the one who blesses Jesus is blessed. And the one who curses Jesus is cursed. And in Jesus, the offspring of Abram, all nations are blessed. 
So this passage right here is pointing us to Christ. He is the offspring who inherits the kingdom of God. So what does that mean for you and me? If you have any hope, if I have any hope of being in God's kingdom, the kingdom of blessing, that's characterized by restored relationship to God, restored relationship to one another. If you want any hope of that, then it comes through Jesus. There's no hope outside of Jesus. The kingdom of God is through the offspring who is Christ. So there is a very simple question. Whose kingdom are you in? What are you hoping in, brothers and sisters? All of us know the gravity of sin. We all understand what sin does to us. It damns us. We all know at night or throughout the day, we all understand that sin makes us guilty. So where is your hope? If your hope is in anything besides this offspring of Abram, then you are still in old creation and not in new creation. You are still dead in your sins and not called to light. And what we see in Genesis 12 is a paradigm shift. From Genesis 11, we see God descending and coming to man, and the, res- the, re- the result is blessings. So whose kingdom will you be in? Getting into God's kingdom is actually, on one hand, quite difficult, because you have to have your sins forgiven. And the only way to have your sins forgiven is if Jesus dies for you, and only Jesus. There's no other way to have your sins forgiven. But the good news is that Jesus has died. So how do you get into the kingdom of heaven? Trusting in Jesus Christ. If you would turn from your own attempts to be your own God, living life your own way, and trust that Jesus is who he says he is, the God of the world and your Savior, then you will be brought into God's kingdom. And then, brothers and sisters, we worship God. And out of that worship, we preach the gospel because he is worthy. Let's pray. Lord, we are so thankful that there's Genesis 12 and there's hope of blessings on your terms when you descend to man. So I pray for my brothers and sisters that they would enjoy and that they would savor the God who saves, that they would savor you and love you. Let them love you. Let them see their sin, but let them see your goodness and let it move them to worship. Let's worship with power in this next song because of what you've done and let us live lives of obedience that are worshiped to you because you are the God who saves. And I pray for any non-Christian here, Lord, that right now you'd be calling them into new creation, just like you did for Abram. And just like you did for me 25 years ago. In Jesus' name, amen.